Hello and welcome back to this lecture 34 on bio microelectromechanical systems. Let us do a quick preview of what we did <laughs> last time. So we talked about uh, designing and development of electrochemical valves. Uh, this was followed by capillary force valves and thermocapillary effect. And we use this effect also to study uh, pumping, micro pumping and valving later on. So as you know capillary force valves are essentially based on electrical fields applied to bubbles uh, with a unequal or non-homogeneous distribution of charge on the surface. Similarly, thermocapillary effect is done by changing uh, the surface tension on both ends by heating a, dif a bubble differentially. And uh, the idea is that the bubble move towards, moves towards the, the lower surface tension. Well, the surface energy kind of balances for the bubble to move into that direction. We also talked about micro pumps uh, and then classified them into mechanical and non-mechanical. And this is essentially dependent on the way uh, that um, energy is being added to the system. Uh, you can have uh, energy added by means of vibrating membrane or a vibrating boundary uh, which can be the mechanical micro pump and the non-mechanical basically would include uh, a form of energy added without uh, any vibrating membrane and the energy is directly pumped in by other inducing mechanisms like electric fields, magnetic fields, so on and so forth. We also talked about pumping pressure, head and efficiency. Uh, pumping uh, pressure as you know, you know uh, pressure head is basically also found out by uh, looking at the Bernoulli's uh, equation and efficiency is essentially uh, the, uh, the actuation efficiency. Uh, so, so, the, so the, uh, this is basically equal to the flow rate uh, causing, okay, so, so therefore the pumping efficiency is also the difference between or, or the ratios between the power required for uh, pumping uh, divided by power required for actually uh, actuating uh, the micro pump. So essentially power supplied, it is a ratio between the power generated by means of flow and the power supplied into the system. So uh, this is as far as uh, last lecture goes and now today we will be starting on designing um, uh, and we also talked about in the last lecture about one thing uh, which was a, a kind of phenomena which was related to peristalsis. Peristalsis as we know also is a motion of traveling contractile in a micro channel which causes flow to happen. And so therefore, uh, we essentially discussed about the a three layer device wherein actuation is done by uh, means of, uh, by mechanical means, by moving boundaries with high pressure compressed air uh, flowing in a sequential manner into the blisters which causes the movement of the fluid underneath it. And so therefore, uh, essentially what happens is that uh, the contractile motion is discretized uh, and which results in a unidirectional flow within the microchip. So today we will be discussing a design problem to begin with where we talk about how such mechanical pumps can be uh, designed and developed. So therefore, in this particular example as you see, uh, there is a peristaltic pump uh, which has uh, three pump chambers and a circular uniform piezo disc, unimorph piezo disc as actuator and uh, the pump membrane has a diameter of about 4 mm okay and the pump works at a frequency of about 100 hertz and we need to determine the volume flow rate uh, at back pressure the maximum membrane deflection is about 40 microns. So here we actually assume that the membrane deflection uh, that the membrane deflection give me a minute here so that we actually assume that the membrane deflection follows the deflection function of a thin circular plate So we assume the diameter or, or the deflection at radius r from the center is also equal to uh, d max which is the maximum deflection at the center minus 1 minus small r by big r square whole square. Essentially small r is the radial distance from the center of a point and big r is the overall radius. of the membrane 
okay. So using this deflection function we need to find out what really is uh, the volume displacement at a certain radius r from uh, uh, the center of such a uh, circular uniform unimorph uh, membrane which is moving and causing the peristalsis effect within the micro pump. So uh, here essentially let us uh, draw this you have a circular chamber here and there is a radial distance r over which we are considering the deflection and so really and, and also we are assuming that uh, there is a distance dr in this region of the element which we are considering the deflection of. So essentially if you just draw a circle around this point of radius r and another circle at radius r plus dr if you would like to consider the area which is available between this r and r plus dr so the area essentially is if you do it uh, so if you consider a small angle d phi here between the radius r and r plus dr and we want to find out really what is the area of cross section or, uh, or what is the area total area of this particular element here which is shaded as you are seeing it is really given by r d phi times of dr okay. So essentially r d phi being this length sector and uh, dr is the small elemental distance between the r and r plus dr the twin radii as we are seeing. And we can assume that uh, this particular section here d phi being very very small uh, represents kind of a rectangle it is not really having um, uh, you know an, an issue of uh, differential distances on both sides. So you have the opposite sides uh, the, the difference between the opposite sides so small in this case that we can safely in, uh, assume this whole area to be rectangular in nature the thickness of the rectangle being dr okay and uh, the length of the rectangle being r d phi as defined by the length of the arc on this particular side. So having said that we can calculate uh, the delta v uh, the small elemental volume as this particular element deflects dr let us say where dr is a function of r the deflection we can calculate the total volume delta v by multiplying this particular area term with the deflection which is d max times of 1 minus small r by capital R square whole square okay. So that is what uh, the distance uh, dr would be or the deflection dr would be times of r d phi dr and if you want to find out the overall uh, volume in this case let us say the total volume deflected of the circular component would also be given as, as phi varies from 0 to 2 pi radius small r varies from 0 to capital R you have this as d max times of 1 minus small r by big capital R square whole square r dr d phi and uh, this essentially comes equal to 2 pi by 3 d max times of square of r and this is uh, nothing but as you know uh, the d max in this case is essentially uh, 40 microns it has been mentioned in the question that maximum deflection at the center is 40 10 to the power of minus 6 meters radius r uh, has 2 millimeter size because the diameter is 4 mm so it is 2 10 to the power minus 3 meters and therefore the total volume deflected is essentially equal to 2 pi by 3 times of 2 10 to the power of minus 3 square times of 40 10 to the power of minus 6 meter cube okay and this becomes equal to 3.35 10 to the power of minus 10 meter cube this is what essentially the total volume deflected then would be. So at a relatively low frequency give me a minute here so at a relatively low frequency 
which is actually 100 hertz in this case it's relatively very small we assume uh, that you know there is a linear relationship between the volume flow rate and the pumping frequency okay so we assume a linear relationship So in other words the pumping rate Q is delta V times of F which is 3.35 10 to the power of minus 10 times of 100 which is essentially 3.35 10 to the power of minus 8 meter cube per second which is about 2 ml per minute. That is what essentially the, the total flow rate in this particular case would be okay. Now uh, we have also talked about thermocapillary effect and I would like to just uh, do another example uh, with you guys about how this effect gets realized. So let me just re reiterate what thermocapillary would mean. Uh, it is also known as Marangoni effect. Uh, essentially you have a bubble okay and a bubble is essentially a two phase. So you have either a gas bubble inside liquid or an oil bubble inside liquid. Some kind of change in the, uh, the, the continuum there are two phases uh, which describes a, a bubble or two states which describes a bubble. Now in this kind of a situation when you heat the surface of the bubble differentially with one side heated more in comparison to other there is a change in surface tension and there is a distribution of surface tension across the bubble. So the bubble would have a tendency of moving towards the lower surface tension from the higher surface tension okay. So it moves forward in the direction of the lower tension or in, in terms of it moves forward in direction of the, the, the more heated or more prominently heated side. So that is essentially what a Merangoni effect or thermocapillary effect would mean okay. So let us actually do an example where we talk about how uh, we can determine the driving force on a bubble uh, given the surface tensions of uh, water air interface and uh, that too given at different points of temperatures in which uh, the bubble is heated up okay. So let us uh, do this example. on Marangoni effect. So we have a thermal bubble which is created in a capillary this capillary has a radius of 50 micrometers the temperature at the two ends of the bubble are 100 degrees and 50 degrees Celsius respectively okay. You have to determine the driving force of the bubble. given the surface tension of the water air interface is 58.9 Newton per meter at 100 degrees Celsius and 67.91 Newton per meter at 50 degrees Celsius okay. So let us say we have uh, a pressure difference at two ends of the bubble which is estimated as delta P. So delta P pressure difference is essentially uh, also defined by twice the surface tension of sigma or sigma uh, of air water interface at 50 degrees Celsius and uh, that at uh, 100 degrees Celsius as you know with the increase in temperature the surface tension decreases okay this per unit r this is uh, the standard formula of determining the pressure difference which is existing within a bubble in a certain environment and delta p is essentially the, the pressure differential that the bubble can withstand still becoming one integral with respect to the uh, atmosphere and that essentially is given by uh, the difference in surface tensions across so one side would have definitely 
more withstanding capability and another would have less withstanding capability and so essentially the, uh, the, the total pressure difference in that case across the surface is basically uh, twice sigma by r twice delta sigma by r where delta sigma is the difference between the surface tensions at both temperatures okay. So, here uh, both are given and essentially the area here in this case is nothing but uh, as you know with the 0 contact angle uh, the total area available on a line wise basis. So, the total area available at 0 contact angle when we assume the whole droplet has kind of spread over the surface is pi r square okay pi times of square of r uh, r is the radius of the of the particular bubble in question. So, the force f is also equal to delta p times of a in that case which is actually equal to nothing but uh, you know because you have uh, uh, this area pi r square uh, you have uh, twice pi r times of sigma at 50 degrees Celsius minus sigma at 100 degrees Celsius respectively which on calculation comes out to be equal to 0 0.9 micronewtons. So, as you are seeing here the force really uh, which is uh, you know uh, which, which kind of arises because of this differential surface tension is only about 0 0.5 0 0.9 micronewtons about close to 1 micro uh, 1.0 micronewton and uh, this is sufficient to move the small mass of uh, the fluid bubble towards the uh, surface which is uh, more properly or more strongly heated up actually. So, that is what um, uh, Marangani effect uh, essentially would do. Let us uh, also study some other forms of micro pumps which may be of interest to the readers. Uh, but this right here is a very good illustration of a valve less rectification micro pump and what essentially it means is that you have uh, um, it is all based on again the, the Bernoulli's principle as you see this side here this end here acts like a diffuser and here acts as a nozzle. So, as you know uh, the if we assume the, the overall pressure head or the pressure difference between both sides okay, between this side and this side which is also given by uh, height delta h is 0 you know it is an odd, odd basically the pressures on both sides here are same to each other. Uh, therefore, in th that kind of a situation uh, of course, because of the greater amount of cross sectional area here the pressure head would be more okay, and the velocity head would be less. Uh, however, in this particular area as you are seeing so this is here where the pressure head is more and the velocity head is less. And uh, uh, in fact, on the other end, uh, if, if you look at really in this particular case, uh, the pressure head is less, and the velocity head is more. Okay, so therefore there is a differential pressure delta p between these, which causes the fluid to kind of move in this particular direction. All right, so it moves all the way from the high pressure zone towards the low pressure zone here. Okay, and so fluid moves in this direction across the micro channel. Similarly, uh, there can be a situation where the fluid can move in the opposite direction uh, as well, depending on if just you uh, are able to kind of change the geometry here. Also, uh, there can be active valveless rectification systems where, in this particular micro channel area, can be further using a peristalsis effect be changed. So, therefore, not only there is a pressure head, but also there is a continuous force here which kind of vibrates the membrane and compresses it. So, that all the fluid which is inside actually goes towards the higher velocity head side or lower pressure head side. Because more is the cross sectional area, uh, lesser would be the addition in the velocity component here due to this pumping action. Lesser is the cross sectional area, more would be the addition of the velocity component. So, it is it acts as kind of an amplifier in the same direction as we considered before and the pump actually pumps out fluid uh, from the right end towards the left end. So, that is essentially what uh, this uh, valveless rectification pumping systems uh, do. Okay. Now, uh, there are other forms of pumping systems one of them being rotary pumps with spur gears as you can see here in this illustration. So, here as you see there are two gears as you can uh, kind of see here uh, this is gear 1, gear 2. 
and uh, they are moving in a direction. Uh, this moves in anti-clockwise sense, this is actually driven in the clockwise sense and as a result of which the, uh, the material which is inside this micro channel kind of gets pushed forward and flows in this direction. Okay? So, therefore, uh, this is also used for cases where the flows uh, are concerning um, a little bit high viscous material, you know, high viscous fluids. Here is another illustration of uh, a very interesting ferrofluidic micro pump, magnetic micro pump. Here you create a plug okay, and this plug can be uh, of a ferrofluidic nature. That means you have oil which is immersing some ferrous nanoparticles okay, and it moves as a plug. Now, when you actually apply a permanent magnet in such a situation, uh, there is always uh, a tendency that as you move the magnet, uh, the ferrofluidic plug also moves along with it. Okay? And in, uh, in that manner, it kind of pushes the fluid past it and thus a delta H difference can be created, uh, which is supplied by this magnetic field onto this coupling ferrofluidic plug. So, there is another very interesting moving mechanism of moving fluids at the microscopic length scale as you can see here in this particular illustration. Okay? Uh, the third uh, kind of uh, pump is really very interesting, it is uh, the ferrofluidic micro pumps and you have to really consider in details the various stages from 1 to 5 of this particular pump and how it behaves. So, you have instead of one ferrofluidic plug, two plugs. Okay? Essentially, this particular illustration is one uh, plug and, and this here as you see is the second plug. And you have instead of one magnet, two magnets 1 and 2 which are uh, placed on both ends, one towards the inside of the circle, another towards the outside of the circle. Let us say we call these 2 and 1 uh, respectively. So, we move further the magnet 2 in the clockwise sense. Okay? So, as the magnet moves, it drives this ferromagnetic plug along with it as you can see and here it has kind of touched this particular system and then it becomes one integral and blocks this port mind you. This is blocking this port. Okay? In the next illustration as the magnet is further moved, uh, so it changes position further and goes here. Uh, what happens is that this is a fixed magnet. As you see this is a fixed magnet, it is not moving. The variable magnet moves the other portion of the plug away from uh, this static plug here which has been formulated. But what happens is that it creates a zone of low pressure here in this region okay, as it does it. And as you know fluid is capable of going into or rushing into the low pressure region. It kind of rushes into this low pressure region and this magnet again comes back and as it comes back it pushes the whole column here because this is a static magnet cannot go forward. So, as it pushes this thing it pushes the whole column back into this. and so. Essentially, the fluid transport is taking place from the second arm here, okay, as you are seeing. So, this is the second arm which causes the fluid transport to happen and this is the first arm which is the inlet to the micro pump. Now, as you rotate this fast, uh, the fluid kind of comes into every time as the magnet, uh, as the ferrofluidic material joins here and then splits here and then as it moves along, this whole other path of fluid is actually injected out and that is how uh, in the sequence of 5 steps, you can get uh, to realize a continuous flow micro pumping system. This is again another very interesting example osmotic micro pumps. Uh, they happen especially uh, because of membrane pressure. We have done this before what osmosis really means. It is uh, the, the diffusion of ions across uh, a membrane, a semi permeable membrane with uh, you know a concentration gradient across it. So, you have let us say salt solution on one end and plain water on another end. So, there is a tendency of this salts to diffuse away from the higher concentration side towards the lower concentration side and uh, this itself causes some kind of an osmotic pressure which can drive the fluids across this membrane as the ions cross over. Uh, simply speaking, the ions do not have to move uh, particularly on its own okay? and uh, essentially uh, what happens is that it just drives the fluid along with it. Uh, and so, therefore, they, if there is an ion movement, there is automatically a fluid movement as well. You just need to create a concentration gradient across uh, uh, the diffusing mechanisms. So, this kind of uh, brings us to uh, an end of uh, these, uh, these micro pumping devices and uh, we have kind of seen 
what microfluidics so far can do uh, with respect to mixers, valves, pumps uh, and different kind of bioassays like the PCR uh, microchip whether it is space domain or time domain so on so forth. So, we have done kind of a range of uh, applications of microfluidics into biomems uh, which can serve various useful and important purposes. Now, the only question which remains unaddressed uh, so far is uh, how do we really fabricate such devices using silicon processing and uh, as you know as I have discussed before repeatedly uh, the focus of these bio MEMS or um, you know in, in general MEMS uh, is, is, is kind of developing novel and newer fabrication techniques of realizing these is prototypes. And um, as we started with silicon and MEMS and we discussed at the very towards the very beginning of this lecture. Uh, there was a general uh, trend of following uh, processes and steps which are normally used in the silicon industry because the first material which came into the purview of MEMS was silicon. Uh, but as move, things moved along there were polymer MEMS, there were uh, carbon MEMS, there are basically biological devices or made uh, things made up of biological entities which would be uh, serving as bio MEMS devices etcetera. And so therefore, uh, we can really um, study or begin this study of fabricating devices with alone doing in more details what we can do with silicon processes. So, in a nutshell the materials again I just like to use this slide from my other lectures before that we can use uh, a silicon microelectronic materials primarily glass quartz because of their optical transparency and some polymers here like PDMS, PMA you have probably already seen part of this uh, activity before Teflon and biological entities like cells, proteins, DNA which gives novel frontiers in bio MEMS. So, let us uh, talk about a uh, little bit about uh, crystal structures and how uh, can we organizedly characterize silicon as. So, if you consider this particular uh, area here it is essentially the transition from liquid to solid. So, you have uh, a liquid state underneath it, a solid state over it and this is also the zone of fusion. So, let us consider the properties here let us say that you have a temperature in the solid phase T2, liquid phase T1 and there is a flow of heat from the higher temperature towards the lower temperature. So, if you actually consider Newton's law of cooling uh, what it states is that if you suppose have a, a certain sectional area here in a particular solid let us say these are two fixed boundaries across which you are considering heat transfer and you have this particular section across which you are considering what is the rate of heat flow. So, essentially uh, here let us say uh, you have a q dot heat which is flowing across this boundary and across this boundary q dot x plus dx. So, essentially uh, it is a process dependent on the temperature gradient available across this. So, if I have a temperature T t difference d t difference between these two surfaces therefore, the heat flux q dot x is represented as minus k times a times of dt by dx ok. k is uh, so called the thermal conductivity of the material, a is the area of heat flow, area of heat flux ok and which is perpendicular actually perpendicular to this particular cross section uh, the cross sectional plane of this particular figure and uh, dt by dx is the temperature gradient which is available. So, now you are seeing here that there is really a temperature gradient and therefore, there should be a heat flow. Let us say on this side, so you have this as the zone of fusion, you have a certain heat flow Q 1 x from the liquid into the zone of fusion and on this side you have a certain heat flow Q 2 x uh, based on the zone of fusion to uh, the, the solid zone. And let us suppose that T 1 is much much greater than T 2 because T 1 of course, being in the liquid state would have more temperature than that being in the solid state. So, the direction of heat flow therefore, by using Newton's uh, law of uh, cooling would be from T 1 to T 2 right from the higher temperature to the lower temperature. And so, let us actually write down the equation of such a flow ok. So, let us suppose we have this uh, solid emanating out from this small zone of fusion here and here you have liquid state surrounding. So, this is liquid the solid silicon is a zone of fusion ok. And uh, essentially you have uh, properties k s as the conductivity of the solid phase 
k l as the conductivity of the liquid phase and uh, let us suppose that you have different or differential d t by d x uh, this let us consider as that in the liquid phase and this let us consider as that in the solid phase. Okay. So, the total amount of heat flux across the zone of fusion would really be equal to minus k l times a d t by d x in the liquid phase right. The heat across into the zone of fusion minus of minus of k s solid phase times of a times of d t by d x in the solid phase okay. and that essentially is the total amount of heat which passes uh, into that atmosphere or into the solid phase from the liquid uh, phase. And if we consider um, you know d m by d t as the formulation of solid from liquid and l be the latent heat of uh, a formulation of um, uh, you know uh, or, or latent heat of change of state. So, therefore, this amount of heat needs to be lost from the liquid to achieve the solid. So, this amount of the heat is effectively the heat across the zone of fusion which leads to the formulation of solid silicon. Okay. So, considering that you have this L d m by d t which is the amount of heat uh, required by the zone of fusion and d m by d t is of course, the rate of change of rate of formulation of mass is actually equal to minus scale a d t by d x at uh, the liquid phase minus minus k s a d t by d x in the solid phase. Okay. A is the cross sectional area of the zone of fusion and d t by d x is the thermal gradient in the n direction. Let me just write this down. So, A is the cross sectional area of the zone of fusion okay. and d t by d x is the thermal gradient in n direction. K L is the thermal conductivity of liquid, K S is the thermal conductivity of solid. Now, having said that uh, we can really find out that K S times of area A times of d t by d s d t by d x in the solid phase minus k l a times of d t by d x in the liquid phase equal to l d m by d t d m can be substituted as the density of the, um, the solid silicon times of area of cross section of the particular solid that is formulated. We assume a uniform cross sectional area at least at the interface times of d x, where d x is the differential of solid that is produced in time d t. Okay. That is what the whole idea is. So, this can be written as L rho A times of d x by d t. So, d x by d t essentially is nothing but the pull rate, the velocity of formation of uh, solid silicon okay. that is what d x by d t would naturally mean. And uh, if you assume uh, the only situation where uh, this, this d x by d t can be maximum uh, would be the case when this here effectively is 0. Okay. Mathematically that is what it is. So, if uh, at the most L rho A d x by d t max is can be written as uh, thermal conductivity of the solid times area of cross section times d t by d x of the solid phase. Okay. And uh, essentially um, you know we, we can, so this is corresponding to k L d t by d x of the liquid phase being equal to 0. What it means is that we assume only a one directional heat flux uh, problem or heat, the heat flux is assumed only to flow in one direction. From the, uh, from the liquid directly into the zone of fusion. There is no heat loss across uh, the surroundings. Whatever flow or whatever heat flows in is exactly whatever heat flows out. Okay. So, therefore, uh, if we consider that to happen and we consider K L A d t by d x is 0, um, then in that case 
the maximum velocity comes out to be uh, k s by l times rho d t by d x in the solid phase. So, essentially whatever the temperature gradient in the solid phase is from the zone of fusion onwards would determine uh, multiplied by thermal conductivity of the solid by uh, things like you know uh, the latent heat of formation and the density of solid silicon this would determine the maximum pull rate or the maximum you know velocity okay. So, that is essentially written as V max equals d x by d t equals uh, k by rho l d t by d x okay and uh, so in reality really in reality uh, maximum pull rail is, ne is never used. As I told you before that uh, the crystalline quality is a very sensitive function um, of the pull rate. So, the crystal quality really depends on pull rate. So, you really cannot go very high in terms of pull rate otherwise there would be a set of point defects which can quickly escape and go into the solid material. However, too much gradient also may create large thermal stresses and thus dislocations particularly in large diameter wafer. So, in a nutshell uh, it is really the optimum best which can be derived experimentally as to what the pull rate would be in real terms. So, that is one method of how uh, a certain direction or certain orientation a prominence of one direction is used in, in silicon crystals. So, I would like to close this particular lecture here uh, as the time is almost over. But in the next lecture we will look at another method um, of uh, formulation of silicon followed by some of the uh, more detailed processes uh, of MEMS industry uh, which are borrowed from microelectronics. Thank you.